Until recently, I was working in the aeronautical industry. This is one of the most interesting and amazing places to work in for an engineer. You can find in one single place people from different backgrounds, engineers, designers, experts from all technical fields, and you find the most talented of them gathered around one single project that is making people fly. All these people are engaged in their work in a way that you might even consider that it's inappropriate. They love what they do. They put so much passion in building planes. But when you come up with a new idea, challenging a little bit the way we make planes, even a small evolution, you get instant feedbacks. People reject your ideas very quickly. Many people tell you, well, it's not going to be possible. It's going to be too hard. Maybe it's not worth it. How can it be? Seriously, how can it be that the people who build planes, that the people who make people fly, are so reluctant to change a single bit of the plane? How can it be that no matter how young they are, no matter whether they are designers, engineers, pilots, lawyers, why is breaking rules so challenging for them? All the time the status quo, not changing anything, seems to be the preferred option. Of course, we could say we're talking about planes. Changing something on the plane is not easy. You're taking risks, there are people flying in the air. But fair enough. Let's take something easier, something simpler. Okay, do we agree that it's simpler than a plane? No more excuses now. I will just ask you two simple questions. The first one, those of you who have an umbrella that looks completely different from this one, can you raise your hand? Whoa, five or six, <laughs> great. <laughs> Second question, those of you who feel that the umbrella is perfectly designed, I mean practical, easy to use, protecting you correctly, easy to store, you enjoy using them when it's windy, I mean, can you raise your hand if you are perfectly satisfied with umbrellas? Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, five out of more than 100. The conclusion, what I want you to feel is that even a simple object like an umbrella, even though nobody's happy with what it brings us, no major improvements seem to happen. Umbrellas are stable. They do not evolve. They do not change. Okay, let's have a look at another example from another industry. It's a short video. We're going back in time a few years ago in the computer industry. Remember how people reacted when Apple decided to remove both the CD player and Ethernet connectors from the laptop. This is an ad that was on the internet made by a very serious competitor. It was from Lenovo. It shows how most of the IT industry rejected what is now common, what we call now ultrabooks. That's a standard object today, but a few years ago it was something that was dramatic change and that everybody, almost everybody, rejected at the moment. At that moment, Apple broke a rule. They decided to change the way we used to define and design portable computers. Why is this so hard? Why is this so hard for all of us to change something, even when it's such a detail? Why is everyone, including the most talented, most brilliant industrial designers, engineers, so quickly fixed on what an object can be or should be? We could say that it's a natural human phenomenon that human beings are reluctant to change. But can we seriously, seriously accept this? 
At least, I don't believe that we should. Changes around us are happening so fast today that if we keep this negative feeling about changing, our life will be harder and harder. Each day, things are moving around us. Each and every child today should be educated to enjoy change rather than being afraid of it. Change should be a playground for children. So what can we do? For sure, nature plays against us. Our brain has natural tendency to create boxes, to classify things, to make life simpler for us. Exactly as the biologist does when finding new, speci new species, our brain tries to put boxes, to create boxes, to create categories, to order things in our mind. And these categories, these boxes, tend to be pretty rigid. They are quite hard to change once we define what is a car, what is an umbrella, what's a plane, and what it should be. But after that, we could do something to make change less, less violent for us. We could try to avoid reinforcing our brain's natural tendency to create boxes. If we have a look at what we do today, from our very early days, we are taught how to define things properly. We even create books like this, I mean, thousands of pages filled with definitions of what the objects are. And these books do not evolve that fast. These are static definitions of all the world surrounding us. We call them dictionaries. They are supposed to give us the exact meaning of a word. Let me explain. If we take the definition of the umbrella, the umbrella is supposed to be a device consisting of a circular canopy of clothes and a folding metal frame supported by a central rod used as a protection against rain. Now, with that definition in mind, if you ask someone to improve the umbrella, what can he seriously do? If this is an umbrella, what can he do? Move a bit of metal? Change the color? Improve folding mechanism? Is this really the level of redesign that we expect to have better umbrellas? Do you feel the fixation of power of the definition that we create? These definitions give us a clear vision of what the object is, but tend to keep the object being the same. If we step back a little bit, we could wonder who wrote this definition? Where does it come from? In fact, the definition is a direct consequence of designing the object. Whenever a new object appears, be it a product, the umbrella, or a service, sushi delivery, for example, it takes time for the industry to agree on what it is, what makes sense, what works correctly. But after a few initial variations, a few different kind of umbrellas, a few unusual objects, the identity of the object stabilizes. The name and the definition find their way into the dictionary and it becomes, it becomes what is the umbrella. Let's have a look at younger objects. Smartwatch, for example. The definition is a mobile device with a touchscreen display designed to be worn on the wrist. Even though it sounds pretty good for the one that we have here, if we have a look at this one, this is the latest with things activity. It counts your steps, tells you about your daily activity, wakes you up silently in the morning. Essentially, you feel that it's, it's smart. It's smart enough to be, s to be called smart something. It looks like a watch, but if we take the definition, it's not in the scope of the, de of the definition. It has no touchscreen display. It's a classic display analog, like any Swiss watch. Do you feel how poor our definitions in our dictionaries are to talk about the evolution of objects surrounding us? To what extent they are fixing things that we don't really want or that we didn't really intend to fix? If we have a look at our education system, the balance between the time spent learning stable definition of things and the time spent teaching us how to redefine things, how to create definitions, is pretty clear. 
it's about 98% of our time spent on learning rather than challenging things. When was the last time that you were asked to create a definition? For the scientists among you, maybe the day we introduced complex numbers. Maybe that day we told you that we had to redefine what is number. We had to admit that new numbers could have a negative square. This day, in one second, someone changed everything you learned during 18 years before. Do you remember how it felt? This kind of exciting mix of anger, fear, freedom, power. This is change. This is changing definition. From now, how can we seriously expect the world to dramatically improve if we keep training people for managing marginal improvement, marginal changes on the objects surrounding us? People are trained for designing things that are perfectly respecting the contours of century-old definitions. Can we still believe that change will happen without us? We don't believe so, at least. To be able to redesign things, to go beyond their classical definitions, we need a new kind of approach. And we need it now. We need it widespread, not only for engineers, not only for designers, but for our politicians, our journalists, everybody surrounding us. It's about business people, it's about everybody. Based on latest research in design sciences, we introduce genetic of things. Genetics of things introduce, offers a new framework to analyze definitions of objects and to see how they can evolve. The idea is very simple behind it. The identity of any object goes way beyond the classical definition you find in the dictionary. It results from an initial design and years of evolution through usage, through people crafting, crafting year after year the object with which they are interacting. Things as they are today are the result of a long process of invisible and slow evolution. For example, each generation of joypads depicted here inherits the genes of the previous generation and there are slight small mutations. In this process we all play a role. Using genetic of things we can make explicit all the forgotten and invisible choices in the design of any object and thus what we can do is discuss the fixation that we have in mind with our classical definitions, and second, force the generation of new variations, new mutations of the objects. Exactly as geneticians reveal the DNA of any living thing, we can do the same for human design artifacts. Once the DNA is visible, anybody can explore the mutation, the value, what they could offer us. If we take the example of a car, this is the classical definition. This definition does not mention, and thus doesn't allow us to challenge, the fact that the car is designed to be driven by one person, that this person owns a driving license, that this person is on board inside the car, that it moves on roads, maybe especially for cars, for years it has doors that can be kept closed, etc., etc. Most of the classical engineering approaches at the heart of the design of the next generation of cars take all these characteristics for, for granted. We need to change this. We need to be able to challenge the roads. We need to be able to challenge the fact that there is a driver on board. And we are here with you talking about genetic of things because we care, because we believe that improving the world we live in is a day-to-day -day job for each and every of you. Because our children need us to improve not only the object we, we live in, we live with, but also the way we educate them, the way we empower them to create change. Mr. Shaw said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man 
persists in trying adapt to, the to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all the progress depends on the unreasonable man. We don't think it's about reason. We think it's about methods and education. So, how long will you keep designing objects without questioning their DNA? How long will you think that the road is granted when you design a car? We all designers. We all need to make change a day-to-day -day game. Should you keep one single ID about genetics of things? Keep this one in mind. Instead of designing inside a definition, allow yourself to redesign the definition itself. Thank you very much.